Planning, Monterey Planning Commission. And uh, first of all, I'd like to take a moment to thank the public for sending in even their thoughts uh, up to including close to the meeting. We do read them and I do appreciate the views. And I'm sure the rest of the commission does as well. Thank you. So uh, on getting to our agenda, I would like to open up for the minutes. Uh, anybody have any comments on the minutes? First, Before like we do that, can we have roll call, please? Oh, that, I forget that about that little thing, like who's attending? Because I, <laughs> I was notified by Jennifer that we're all here. So Jennifer, if, if someone would uh, do a roll call, I appreciate it. Sure thing. First, we have you, Chair Brassfield. Present. Vice Chair Freeman. Present. Commissioner Dawson. Here. Commissioner Fletcher. Here. Commissioner Latassa. Here. Commissioner Millich. Here. And Commissioner Reed. I am here. That is the full planning commission we have on board today. And for staff, we have Community Development Director Kim Cole, uh, Senior, oh, no. Principal Planner Andy Flower, and myself and Sarah Zeal, both admin assistants for the planning division. And Sarah, why don't you take it away with our public comment intro for when it's time for public comment? Sounds good. Uh, any comments coming in? You want to do your little recital on how to call? <laughs> what happened to the minutes? I would so, be, sorry, go ahead. Well, I don't know what happened to the minutes. We kind of the, the public comment come in on subject not on the agenda for the day. Sure, let me go ahead and take it away with the announcement about public comment. I do see some attendees signing on. So I just wanna share some information for how you could participate uh, in the meeting today. We do have a new process in place for public participation, and we encourage members of the public to join our meeting via Zoom Gov, which is a secure service for use by government agencies. Uh, joining the meeting on Zoom is preferred because there's no lag time and you're connected live in real time to the meeting. This meeting is also streamed live on YouTube dot com slash city of Monterey and there will be an approximately 10 second delay on YouTube or on Comcast channel 25 where there can be up to a 90 second delay and if you plan to make a public comment join the meeting using zoom on the app or by telephone to make sure you join in time to accommodate any delays uh, to join the meeting on zoom on your computer or phone you can use the link or phone number on the agenda, which is located at isearchmonterey.org. And since the meeting has begun, you'll find the agenda under the recent tab. And the meeting ID for our webinar is 1615636904. So again, you can join by clicking the link on the agenda or by telephone and dialing 833. 568-8864 toll free and then entering the webinar ID. If you are prompted to enter a participant ID, please press pound. In order to make a public comment, raise your hand using the Zoom function or if you can, are connected by telephone, please dial star nine to raise your hand and then star six when I prompt you to unmute yourself. Um, we do ask that any public commenters turn off their TV or computer speakers or go to another room while connected by phone uh, to eliminate any background noise that might interfere with the, the broadcast. And lastly, I will call on each public speaker in the order of hands raised and the chair has designated a three minute time limit for today's meeting with a countdown that we will show on the screen to assist you and ensure that you don't go over any time. And with that being said, let me check out here for our attendees. We do have a few people in on the call. And if you have any public comment related to items that aren't on the agenda, please press star nine to raise your hands. Are we doing this first or are we approving the consent minutes first? No, we're not doing the minutes first. It was introduced and I just went with it. <laughs> And I don't appear to see anybody raising their hand, so I'll make sure when the time comes for future public comment to make a announcement again about that meeting ID. Thank you, Sarah. Mm -hmm. Let's go ahead and go back to the agenda and, and let's look at the minutes. Any comments on the minutes? 
I move to accept them as presented. Thanks, Mike. Second. Second. Sandy is a second. So we have a first and a second. All in favor, or is there any comments first? All in favor, otherwise say aye. By roll call. Let's do a roll call. Chair Bradfield? Yes. Vice Chair Freeman? Yes. Commissioner Dawson? Yes. Commissioner Fletcher? Yes. Commissioner Latassa? Aye. Commissioner Millage? Yes. And Commissioner Reed? Yes. Thank you. That was unanimous. Okay, so we now are done with the consent. Let's move into the agenda. And I believe we have a presentation on the first item. Uh, yes, commissioners and chair, this is Andy Flower, principal planner, and I would like to share with you for um, 711 Cannery Row. What happened to the public comment? We had that first. We can had a lot of. I thought you had a lot of people lined up, Sarah, who wanted to talk. But, but we have we, viewers in. We have viewers attending the webinar. They just aren't raising their hand right now. Okay. Um, okay. It, I, I apologize for introducing that a little early. Um, if we want to go take it back and, and give those viewers a chance to uh, to produce public comments, then that is up to the chair. So let's move on uh, to and let Andy, since we've already had public comment, let's have Andy make her presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Chair Brassfield. Today I will pre be presenting a use proposal for 711 Cannery Row. I apologize, my Y dropped off there. Uh, 711 Cannery Row. And you may recognize this iconic building, the Monterey Can Canning Company. Uh, and you, you may also recognize uh, the applicant. Um, this is for Paper Wing Theater. They were formerly at 601 Lighthouse and they have now found a new home here at 711 Cannery Row. The zoning is Cannery Row commercial and uh, the general plan is commercial. And you can see here that it is adjacent to our recreation trail. The location is the upper floor corner. Um, you can see here the stairway that leads you to the space. An acoustical engineer submitted a report with the recommendation that the lobby door be um, substantially reinforced so that uh, so that it would contain the sound better. And uh, and here are a list of activities that will take place at the Paper Wing Supper Club Theater and Supper Club. Uh, there will be live plays, musicals, live music, magic shows, karaoke, comedy, parody, burlesque, murder mystery shows, and children theater, children's theater. Uh, so here we have some images of some of the activities that took place when it was at 601 Lighthouse on the upper floor. The, uh, the use will not be considered a bar because the liquor license for the, for the use is uh, 41. And with that liquor license, it, it must be a bona fide eating place, which this one, which this activity, it, it is. It's a, a supper club and the theater activity will take place. Um, here we have the hours of operation. So restaurant only Monday through Saturday, 10 a.m. to 5 p.m. The dinner and show takes place Tuesday through Sunday from 6.30 to 10 p.m. There's also a Sunday brunch, 10 a.m. to 3 p.m. And they would also like to carry on what they've been doing traditionally, which is to have the Rocky Horror Picture Show um, through, from October through November on Saturday only. Uh, it's only a four to five week period where they would like to have that show as mm -hmm. is traditional at midnight. So. Uh, staff finds that this proposal meets the general plan land use and, and Cannery Row zoning objectives. This is a commercial business and, um, and it contains active uses 
and that is appropriate in this zone. Mm -hmm. uh, the existing tenant space uh, would just be taken over with, with a new similar use. There would be no building expansion and there is no additional parking required when the use of an existing building changes and or intensifies within this Cannery Row zoning district. This use would not be detrimental to public health, safety, or welfare of persons residing or working in or adjacent to the neighborhood. Uh, the closest residential structure is about a thousand feet away. Um, as the structural changes will be required to be made to the lobby door. And, and with that, the structural, uh, excuse me, the acoustical engineer has set, it, set things up so that this applicant can then test the internal sound limits um, or the, the internal noise. And, and with that, it, it is um, understood what the external noise would be. And so that way it's, it's easier to monitor on a daily basis. But we did include a, a condition that, um, that of course resonates the, the uh, 65 decibel limit would, would still need to be met. And so uh, verification of the maximum internal noise level shall be confirmed during a performance. The applicant is, is on the line today and, and you can certainly ask her more questions about that. But um, in working with her, she certainly understands that that's the expectation. And uh, following construction of the new lobby door, the continuous noise level should not exceed the following internal limits. So um, it would be 85 to 90 decibels for the continuous noise. And, um, and there may be uh, a sudden noise that, that would maybe be a little bit higher than that. So they are also asked to comply with um, if, if the windows at the front and side are open, then that sound, the sound limitation that we just looked at, um, it would need to be reduced by at least 10 decibels. So with that, staff recommends approval for this use permit to allow live entertainment and dancing at the dinner theater, which is uh, Paper Wing. Uh, th there were some additional pieces of information that were forwarded to all commissioners and I do have those available at my disposal um, if, if we have any questions that uh, that have to do with that. So, yes, Commissioner Millich. Uh, yes, Andy, I recall reading in the uh, documents that the nearest residential units are 900 feet away. Oh, is it 900 and not a thousand? I thought it was 900, but we just did a rough measurement from our Google map. Um, yeah, I apologize for that. I don't know. So at least it's at least 900. Yes, at least 900. I think I was wanting to not, yeah, to be conservative in that estimation. Thank you. Certainly. Any other questions? Andy, I, I have a question. Uh, thanks for your excellent presentation. Um, the, um, does the building have an elevator? Oh, that's a great question. Uh, we've been working with the um, representative for Cannery Row Company, and and so I I can let our applicant talk through it a little more. But my understanding is that uh, what will be used is the crossover, the walkover, and there is an elevator in the adjacent building. Oh, okay. Yeah. Well, it's not really the Planning Commission's purview, but um, they will need ADA you know, compliance, so, okay, yeah. thank you. They've been working with the building department for over a year now in okay. making Great. sure that they had everything that they would need. Good. Thank you for the question. Any other questions? Andy, is the, the building circumference uh, the same as the property? Because I believe that the 65 DBA limits are at the property line. Oh, that's a great question. I believe, yes, I believe that the building extent is at property line, yes. Okay. Any other questions? Okay, can we hear from the applicant? Sarah, if you could let her give access. 
Sure, absolutely. Um, so just a friendly reminder, um, if the applicant already is not on the line. Hi, I'm Coley McBride. Hello. <laughs> Sorry. Um, we were encouraged by yes, the school the district. Is on the line, can you please raise your hands? She's speaking now. Oh, it looks like you're already permitted to talk. My apologies. Go right ahead. Hi, I'm Coley McBride, and I am the owner of Paper Wing Theater Company. Uh, we're just um, thrilled to be part of this um, this process, and um, we're just ecstatic that the city of Monterey and the Cannery Row Company have all really worked hard to um, make us feel at home and just let us know, even though we've obviously had some hiccups with COVID, that we are definitely wanted and desired and they feel that we are going to uh, add not only value to the tourist element that um, Cannery Row Company brings in, but that with our expansive mailing list, we'll be able to kind of showcase the new Cannery Row, which is getting locals back down to Cannery Row to patronize the businesses down there, which I think is going to help everybody during these off-season months as well. Our, um, our mailing list is roughly about 8,000, and about set, I think it's 72.6% uh, of that is uh, locals that are in the 939 um, zip code. So we're, uh, we're creating obviously a lot of buzz with our patrons and followers and uh, have just found the neighborhood to be incredibly hospitable. So um, we're just very excited uh, about the prospects of what this is going to bring. Um, I'm certainly open for questions if anybody needs any clarification or anything, but I think Andy did a pretty great job of covering all the points. I did wanna say that, um, I know that this particular usage uh, is coming under evening entertainment and dancing. Um, I, I really want to reiterate that the only dancing that's going to be done is by the performers. <laughs> and it's not typical of theater audiences to jump up and start dancing. And we certainly don't want to be a discotheque. And we are only going to be open to showcase talent and to serve a meal, it, no matter what the entertainment is. Um, we're definitely, that's, that's part of the vision. Thank you for that. Uh, I do have a question. Um, sure. On your service of beer and wine, it yes. says it's during the meal, but during the presentation of your shows, will they continue to be able to have access to beverages? Um, only, okay, so the plan is that we will have a staggered start time because there's people who want to come in and they take a little bit longer to eat. So our anticipation is that, you know, roughly between 6 and 6.30, we'll start taking reservations. And pretty much the only way that you can get dinner in a show is by making a reservation through our website or uh, through any links that we might have on social media. So the idea is that the patrons will come in, they will be served their super salad along with their fresh baked bread, and, uh, and then they will start their meal whenever they check in. So between 6.30 and 7, we'll have different um, parties checking in. Um, and the, the beer and wine, and it's only beer and wine, will be served during the meal, and then we're going to clear the plates and clear everything um, right about about 10 minutes before showtime, give people the opportunity to use the restroom. Um, I, I think that if people are finishing off their wine or they would want to uh, purchase something during the intermission, uh, the idea is to keep kind of glasses and dinnerware off the tables to make extra noise when there's a performance. But then we're going to serve um, dessert during intermission. So uh, likely people will be enjoying a glass of wine during intermission with their dessert if that's if they were so inclined. And that goes for non-alcoholic as well. Absolutely, absolutely. We just we kind of want to keep utensils off the table at that point. Once uh, you know, once the desserts are done, we're going to have the the servers will. Um, the tables and if, but if they still had their coffee or their wine or their um soda or iced tea or whatever they would be certainly you know allowed to continue to sip on that during the remainder um but once the um once the intermission is over uh we're gonna you know we'll be starting to close everything down and so there won't be an opportunity for anybody to make any purchases like after the show or um even after the intermission 
Thank you. You're welcome. Any, any other questions? Okay, if no other questions, I'd like to open up for public comment. Sarah, if you would. Sure. I'll just go or ahead Jennifer. and reiterate that public comment information again. Um, feel free to join the meeting using Zoom or by dialing 833-568-8864. And our meeting ID is 161-563-6904. And if anyone that is attending the meeting would like to make a public comment, please press star nine so you can raise your hand and I can unmute you to talk with the Planning Commission. Okay, it doesn't look like I'm seeing anything, anyone raising their hand right now, but I'll be sure to keep an eye on our attendees and alert you if anyone raises their hand. Thank you. I would uh, like to bring it back to the commission for comments. I have two comments. This, I think that Terry and Mike and I uh, saw a building use for this big, huge building for the big artichoke years ago. Yeah. And then, it was like the whole artichoke and then they they didn't move in and the building's been empty all this time available just for this kind of use and the second comment is i don't really think you need to worry about people's eating making noise i have had so much fun going to teatro zinzani in the city and once the show starts the amount of noise people make eating their dinner is like negligible. So I think you've got a great plan and a, a very exciting venue for Cannery Row. Thanks, Cindy. Any other comments? Uh, I do. Um, I think this is a really good, really good use for that building. It's really good use for Cannery Row. Um, uh, although the, the uh, paper white was like one block off of Cattery Row for years and years, and now it's now it's downtown. So that I think that's a good idea. Thanks, Mike. I have a question for Andy. Andy? Yes, Chair. Do you, do you have uh, any previous history with any issues uh, regarding when it was on Lighthouse? And it was at 601 Lighthouse. We, to my knowledge, there were no, no code enforcement issues. Thank you. I didn't expect it. I just wanted to ask the question. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, if uh, no other comments, do I, can I solicit a? Yeah. Proposal? So this is Hanson. I move to approve 711 Canary Row use permit application UP-20- Zero two one five to allow live entertainment and dancing. Applicant Colin McBride, per the staff recommendations and findings in the packet. Very good. A second. I'll second that. Dan, second. So we have a first and a second. Any discussion? Let's have a roll call vote. Chair Brassfield. Yes. Vice Chair Freeman? Yes. Commissioner Dawson? Yes. Commissioner Fletcher? Yes. Commissioner Latasa? Aye. Commissioner Millich? Uh, aye, but uh, I take issue with someone who says that, uh, or anyone who says that uh, dining time is quiet. You've <laughs> never been to one of my family dinners. <laughs> Thank you all. Great. And then you finally, all. we have Commissioner Reed also. Yes. Great. Thank you. That was unanimous. Appreciate it. Next, we're moving on to item number four discuss policy guidance for accessory dwelling units ordinance update. And I understand Andy's also on tap for this. Before we get started, and um, and Andy's going to give a presentation, just a brief recap of where we've been and some of your objectives for this evening. Um, the city council recently adopted an urgency ordinance and that ordinance um, basically repealed all of our existing ADU laws because they were in conflict with state law that became effective January 1st. So right now we're working under operation of state law um, the one 
um, law that they did adopt or regulation they adopted was a maximum height limit for accessory dwelling units of 16 feet. And the reason for that was um, they wanted to give the planning commission additional time to discuss if that height limit should be increased. And we didn't want to just automatically end up with 25 foot um, ADUs without a deliberative um, conversation and recommendation to the city council. So that's what's on the books today. We're basically defaulting to state law. Um, and you have a really exciting opportunity today to talk about opportunities. And Andy, I thought, did an excellent job at our last meeting, really detailing some key policy issues and opportunities for our community. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to Andy, who can um, walk you through any questions you might have. Um, also, um, please, uh, we did receive public comment, consider the public comment. And if you're ready this evening, um, maybe you're ready to start crafting some ideas or thoughts that we can bring back an ordinance to you. If not, we can always bring it back at the next meeting. So don't feel pressured on the other side. So with that, I'll turn it over to Andy, who I know will do a great job guiding us through this policy topic. Thanks, Kim. Well, welcome commissioners back to the discussion of ADUs. And I really want to make sure that this is, um, that we're carrying forward the process that makes the most sense to you. I have the same presentation that I had last time around, and that was for consistency sake. I, I also shared it with you. So um, I, I thought maybe having that consistency would be beneficial, but I, I would also like to hear back from you um, whether, um, well, how you would like to proceed. For instance, as I present, you can certainly ask questions as we go, or like discussion can, can uh, go as, as the presentation uh, unfolds. It, Chair, I'll, I'll leave it in your hands. Well, I, I have one air suggestion for the commission. It seems that from listening to council and reading the minutes, that there's is some issues that they want us to focus on. One of them was neighborhood character. <clears throat> as I understand it, um, the state, when it came down, it, it's, didn't leave as much room to say that you can have different standards in the city. Is that correct? Uh, th that, well, yes and no. <laughs> Sorry to be a bit cagey, but uh, we, what we are allowed to do is to have objective design standards. And um, and I, I do have some ideas that that I'd be happy to share with you and we could we could start with those or-, or If we, you would. Okay. Yeah, but let's, let's, let's go ahead and try it this way. Okay. Yeah, I don't, this is, this is Hans, I just don't need to see the whole presentation all over again yeah. and, and to go through that whole, I mean, it was, unless everybody wants to do that, I don't think I need that personally. I would prefer to have you walk us through some issues, um, but, let us ask questions, um, well, and see if we can come to resolution. That's what, or, that's what I'm tr trying to yeah. accomplish here on this one topic, let's get it started here. You know, so if, it was an excellent presentation and very thorough last week, and I'm sure we all paid attention. So I'm with Hansen as far as, you know, let's not rehash it. Okay, and I, I do wanna say though, that sometimes the, the graphics within the presentation might be helpful for the discussion. So, so maybe we could sort of work backwards. We can start with these ideas and then uh, whatever topics come up, I can then cue us to, the, to those particular graphics that, that might help the discussion. Does that Excellent. Okay. So if we could uh, start with this topic of the districts and they, uh, in the city, is there any identif identification issues that we can focus on or not? You said it's a yes or no answer, so. Right, well, so while we can't focus on districts per se, what we can focus on, and are you, a are you able to see my screen right now? Yes. Yes. Certainly. Okay. Great. So, so these are two ideas that um, that have bubbled up for me out of, you know, looking through this information and, and thinking about what may be the best path forward for us. And also looking at other cities, uh, some of the comments that we've received from other folks have, have been, oh, have you looked at this city or that city? And, and, and so the first idea, additions to a primary house intended 
for either ADU or junior ADU shall meet all setback requirements of the underlying zoning. So, so because the state code is silent on additions, um, there, there appears to be some room for a city to make this kind of declaration or to make this kind of regulation. And um, so, so for number one, I feel, I, I believe that if, if we, and, and we still need to have this parsed out by our, our legal team, to, but if, if we were to move in this direction, I think that this addresses that character issue because I think the biggest threat to our neighborhood character is the idea that you could suddenly get as close as four feet to a property line, that that, that really sort of takes our zoning and, and turns it on its head. It, it creates surprises uh, and uh, maybe often not, un, not welcome ones, particularly because one, one point is made, has been made very clear and that's that we cannot, we cannot have an ADU or a junior ADU go through a discretionary review. So that means that not only can, it not, can a proposed ADU not be held by architectural review committee review, but it also cannot be held by um, staff review. So there, there can be no um, discretionary review. So it all goes through the building department, but this first idea would, would help um, stabilize that, um, the predictability that most people look to zoning right now to, to provide. You know, so I, have, Andy, I, have a, I, have a, I want to add a comment here, and that is that when you look at this from, let's say, the 30,000 foot view, do we want to uh, preserve the integrity of Monterey's residential zoning, R1, R2, R3, so that when a person buys a home or an apartment or a condo, they know what zone they're buying into? This number one uh, appears to preserve the zoning that Monterey has for residential property? To the extent possible, yes. I think that's well said, uh, Commissioner Freeman. I, I think that um, th it's also important to keep in mind that if somebody were to construct a detached ADU, that that would still be allowed to have that four foot distance to, the, but only at a 16 foot height as it stands today. So within an R1 zone, that could make perfect sense. But in an R3 zone, and, and that's where we get to idea number two, is just in the recognition that um, as, as Chair Brassfield was suggesting that we have different you know, districts, I think it was you know, called, but hmm. so it's districts and, and neighborhoods that um, within the R3, though, that R3 is already multifamily. So there's already sort of a built-in expectation that there would be potentially something other than a single family that could be constructed next door to you. And, and so the op, but I'm sorry, Commissioner Millich, I saw your hand raised. No, it's okay, go ahead. Oh, so, um, but going forward, yes, with idea number two, the idea there is, is because we want to prioritize off street parking, because I think most of us recognize, particularly in these R3 zones, there's often, um, uh, it's a it's a hot commodity parking and and so the, the leverage that we have is if we allow for height above 16 feet we could potentially as a as an objective design standard say taller than 16 feet may be permitted if there is a garage at the ground floor i would like to just <laughs> add one point of clarification um commissioner Frieda, uh, freeman brought up the issue of when people buy their property with a specific zoning that they know what to expect. And I, I do need to just briefly um, set the baseline on state law is, is that single family properties, basically all of them in the city of Monterey, you are now allowed to have a single family house, an accessory dwelling unit, and a junior, a, a junior accessory dwelling unit. So there can be up to three living areas on a single family zoned piece of property. Um, and that changes the baseline. Some of the things that Andy's talking about is some of the nuances um, for additions to the primary house. So maybe not 
converting exist, existing space, but additions, we could restrict possibly to setback requirements of the underlying zoning. So that's a nuance there. I, I just, I think we just all have to become a, accustomed to this uh, concept that on a single family property, you can have the house, the ADU and the JADU. Well, if I may ask the question of Andy, there's a minimum setback uh, under the new state guidelines. Or is that uh, is that going to change anything that we have now? Uh, it changes things only for the detached ADUs. And they have a minimum setback of what? Uh, of four feet, but quite and, often. And can anything be put placed in that four foot? No. Because that's that's one of the things I see around the city. I see people stacking garbage cans, plants, oh, and so forth in that setback. And that's why I asked the question. That's one of the issues that came up in my neighborhood. And, and I do want to clarify also, if you have an existing structure that is on the property line, you are allowed with state law to rebuild at that same footprint at the property line. But there's very strict requirements uh, for fire safety. Um, if once you get any closer than five feet and, and closer than three feet, you really, um, it would be so expensive. It would be prohibitively expensive to have a window. So as far as privacy, then, you, you know, that, that gets assuaged to some degree just because of the building code standards. But I think so it's if, important to elaborate, Commissioner Brassfield, that if they have trash cans or things like that, that's those would be allowed within that setback area. There's no regulation at the city that um, people can't use their side yard for that type of storage. What we're referring to is actual new building construction. It has to maintain four feet. Yeah, I understand, but I also understand that why we originally had setbacks and that's generally safety between buildings as well as view shed. So I, I understand it and just clarification, thanks. Stephen. Uh, separate building construction. Um, let's say, can you, let, let's say there's an, an ADU is going to be added within an existing residence. Can uh, a separate entrance be required Andy? Yes, yes, that is correct. A separate entrance is required for either an ADU or a junior ADU. Yeah. Okay, now, and that involves building steps or whatever, and that has to be reviewed by the building department, so it's not entirely discretionary. Uh, you have to meet building standards. Right, and that's called ministerial when it goes to only the building department. Okay. Now, my other last question is, um, is there any reason why with an ADU that's being added either within the building, which requires a separate entrance, or a building, a new building ADU, is there any reason why we can't make that um, comply with the Americans with Disabilities Act as if it applied, though it doesn't. In other words, can we be more restrictive, actually more liberal as far as extending the, the, the market, opening it to those people who otherwise wouldn't be so, uh, served by uh, ADUs? That's it. That's, that's a good question. question. I, it's, the AD, it's the ADA process. Can we make that applicable to ADUs in separate uh, new buildings and existing buildings? Does Has that question ever been posed? It's certainly encouraged, but as far as ADUs with, um, and I remember, I recall that that ADA question did come up with, um, uh, yes, but with Commissioner Fletcher. Uh, and and the answer to that though is is that it is not considered multifamily as far as the building code is concerned. 
So it, and I understand that the way the law is now, right. can we make them subject to ADU as ADA as if they were in uh, covered by ADA? Because what we're doing is we're taking a residential R1 area and turning it into an R2 or R3. So, I mean, we're getting closer and closer. And my point is, why should we see a segment of our populace, the disabled, who uh, now don't have access to uh, these units? Well, yeah, and I, I would I would encourage any designer out there who might be listening to consider universal design because it, it's not, oh, oh. It's uh, it's beneficial for all, all ages, all population, all abled. And well, what I would like to do is if I would like to see us recommend to the council that first of all, I don't think we should change the the law, the state law. We should just let it shake down for a while, like uh, Seaside is doing, see how it turns out. And then, if in fact it turns out that we are going to make changes, uh, then I suggest that we uh, ask the council to look into uh, making all uh, ADUs uh, ADA compliant as if they were required. It, it has been made clear to us though that we cannot do anything that would further restrict people's ability to construct an ADU. In other words, if, if the state, if the current laws do not um, require ADA, then my understanding is we can't stack a new requirement. Understanding is does not cut it with me. Oh, oh, we'll have we'll have legal certainly look at this. I, I absolutely, and I can bring that back to you next time, and we can okay. our city attorney with us at our next meeting. Certainly. Yeah, I'd like to get you. I'd like to get you some feedback on that because. Uh, this, this, you know, otherwise we're restricting a class of people who uh, don't have access without extending it to, to AD, ADA. And since ADU is being used for as an excessive source, as an extra source of income, okay, I think that uh, ADA should apply to it. But that's just philosophically. Yeah, I, have, I have two comments. One is that I, I, my Stephen, my guess is that the only way that that to work is that you would probably have to have a blanket law that all construction, residential construction comply with ADA for the ADU to apply, for it to apply to ADUs. Cause you, all of a sudden now you're, we can't do anything that segregates the ADUs from the general construction. That, that's my understanding of what, what Andy has said. And so the only way I think if, if there was a general law in, this, in the city of Monterey that basically said, if you're gonna build a new house, it has to be ADA compliant 100%, then we probably can, that would be the general law for the state of for Monterey and, and any ADU would then fall under that. But I don't, you can't just say ADU, you, you have to be ADA compliant, but if you want to build a, a house, you don't have to be ADA compliant. So I, that's, again, I, it's, it's because it's, I understand, but I understand your, your position. You're using ADA just, as a backdoor sword uh, versus a, you're saying it's a benefit, but it's also a deterrent. Um, and I and I understand that. That's fine. Um, it, it, it was a deterrent when when it was passed. The residential uh, and apartment owners association said that it will result in a shortage of apartments because of the extra cost involved. I would think it could make it generally apply, Hanson, by saying that any any and all units that are uh, new units that uh, are out there for rental shall comply with ADA. Then you're, then you're, Stephen. Then you're also saying that then the single family residents, right? No, the ADA no, is, but no, the ADUs no, are, are no, the ADUs. You're not are, listening. It's, it's like, yeah, no, I, I understand, Stephen. I understand what you're saying. I understand what you're saying. I do. I understand what you're saying. You make um, it apply. You make it applicable to all rental, new rental properties. What if I'm building a single family residence that I intend to rent out? What you intend or you're you're constructing it with an extra unit. Well, who says that if I build an ADU that I'm going to rent it out? Right. So, I mean, it, it, we're getting off tangent. So, um, and so, so uh, Andy, Two I do have a couple questions. Over a, a, a piece of copper wire. Um, so, uh, so if there's if it's legal non-conforming, the house is legal non-conforming. 
the ADU does not have to comply with the zoning laws, right? Is that, is that what you're saying? So for example, if there's a garage that is two feet from the edge of the property line, I can put an ADU, ADU unit there and that's not an issue, right? That's correct. You can reconstruct in that same footprint. Okay. Um, and then, so what you also said, what I think you, what you said is, is, for example, we can't say you have 16 feet by right. And then if you want to go above 25 feet, you would or above 16, you would, you'd have to come to planning because it's all ministerial. So, you, okay. I just wanted, okay. So, so the way to get around that would be is if you want to keep, if you, you're allowing to go up um, by keeping the garage, which I think is a great, trade-off because right if, if we're worried if everybody it, which is seems like one of the big concerns is that uh parking issue people parking on the streets and one way to get around that or to to solve that problem is saying okay yeah you can go up rather than taking my garage and turning it into an adu i'm gonna basically make a carriage house i'm gonna keep the garage and i'm gonna add the adu so we get the best of both worlds we're not removing my parking um from from thy site and and so we're get, keep, keeping the garage and plus we're getting the ADU so I, I mean I think that's a good good move I, I agree with Stephen that letting things shake out but I also think that if we're worried about parking if, and that seems to be a lot of the concern I've he heard it from the planning commissioners and other people that parking on the streets is the issue or one of the big issues that that having the height uh, allowance is a way to solve that problem or at least alleviate that problem. Um, and then Andy, also one of the questions that people have asked me or said to me is that they don't believe that bus stop map. Um, yeah. <laughs> and so I, I, I don't know. I mean, I, I went on MST's um, website right before the, the meeting and I couldn't, you can get a map of the, the routes, but you can't get a map of this. At least I couldn't in the five minutes I, Okay, three minutes I spent looking at it. Yeah. I couldn't find all those dots, but I just was curious. You know, some of those dots are either, at least people are saying, are either abandoned or they come once a day or they're, you know, they're not really <laughs> truly. Um, and I, I have no idea. I haven't, I can't remember the last time I wrote MST. I think I was probably in high school. And I can verify again our, our source, but I'm pretty sure that's. This, uh, the source data was a, a, a point file from MST. And, but, you know, it, it could be older. It could be that things have devolved since, I mean, of course, with COVID, everything has devolved. But my understanding, though, is that um, what I do know about the state code is that it does say bus stop. It, and and it's not about being close to a transit center or um, like with CEQA and state law, they talk about very specific, you know, rapid transit places where between certain commuter hours that you have 15 minute intervals. We don't have it, this. Um, we we went through the rabbit hole through the definitions to discover that absolutely this this is just bus stop, and it and there may be a bus that only comes once a day. And according to the state, that checks the box. Andy, may I make a suggestion that if we have any future presentation that this be up and re-examined because Fisherman's Flats, I don't see having uh, buses currently because of budget cuts, nor do I see them in Kona. So I can't speak for the other neighborhoods, but I think that the budget cuts that, that Tamsi has had has created some previous and I don't care if they're keeping them there for future use. It doesn't make any difference. We're not dealing with a future use. We're dealing with what's current. So if you could put that on the agenda to re-examine if we go further than this, I would appreciate it because that is certainly pertinent, I that 500-foot rule. Yes. And, and I can say that so far in our discussions with applicants, we have let them know that it's up to them to prove to us. In other words, this, this is just sort of a... Um, this is some internal analysis that we did with with the data points that we had available to us. But yes, I'm happy to to um, verify and re-examine and bring that back to you. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you. Any other comments on uh, this 
25 foot rule? That's I do. Commissioner Dawson. Um, when, when you consider a 25 foot rule, you're, you're speaking only about R3. Is that true? No? No, sir. No. It's, it's, it's R3 and R1? As far as the, the bus stop? Is that what you well, I'm talking about 25 feet oh. um, uh, carriage houses for, for one. Yes, only R3 is, is what staff is suggesting. And there's, there's no ARC review? Correct. Uh, that's, I think that's crazy because uh, somebody is going to build, a, build a, a nice tall carriage house with windows down to somebody's backyard and there's going to be a war. Now, we, we, if, that, if I may, Commissioner Dawson, uh, one opportunity that, that, uh, that I would be happy to help us pursue if, if given guidance is to consider more about these objective design standard opportunities. We had with our ARC, we had, I, I believe it was 260 lane, and it was a carriage house proposal in an R3 zone, but they had enough uh, FAR, um, and they had enough density to allow a separate unit. So when this was reviewed by the ARC, uh, it, it did take away views in surprising ways that you know, three different planners had been on this over the years and, and nobody anticipated the angle from the neighbors that, um, that this would block their views. And the applicants were wonderful with the iterative process. And what we were able to do is to discover well, if the angle, if the uh, the shape of the of the rooftop were um, in it in the opposite direction, then that could allow for or cross gable. Exactly. Yes. So so that could be a very easy objective design standard that um, we could learn. We could take from the iterative processes that we've embarked on in the you know in the last decades. And, and pull from that and bring to you some of the best case um, opportunities that we've you know explored and 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 bring you images of, of how that worked in the landscape I would be I would be very um, skeptical until I saw it but uh, with a, with a with a carriage house design um, I'm sure there's going to be windows on the sides and those windows on the sides are going to be looking down into somebody's garden. And, and I think that's probably a mistake. If, if I may, Commissioner Dawson, that, that is um, exactly uh, the design that has been proposed for a site that is in an R1 zone. But when they proposed a carriage house, prior to all of the to understanding that there wouldn't be allowed, um, they intentionally left no windows on the, on the neighboring wall. So that again is another objective design standard that we could have in place. Yeah, I, I would like to see that because like, like I say, if someone's going to be, able, be building something like that in the house next to me, I'm going to be upset. And may I suggest that uh, when Eddie's put their second and third story on their plans, yep. that Paul Davis made it the design spec that no windows would look down into yards by making them opaque glass and up to the view, they couldn't open them to look down. So right. I think that could be placed in your design standards. I just want to that. clarify the concept of objective design standards. Think of it as a checklist that somebody in the building department could go through and check. So there's several commissioners hit on this. There is no architectural review allowed. There's no administrative planning review allowed. If we are able to, and the commission wants to, it is simply a checklist, like no windows or all windows opaque facing another property. Um, it has to be really simple and it's a big deviation from what we are accustomed to doing. So um, I just wanted to clarify that. So is this whole concept that we're discussing, so it, it is, everything is about it. And that's one of the reasons why I think council is having some difficulty with it. And uh, sometimes objective design standards are, are um, understood as form-based code, which I have had experience with. So I, I would be happy to um, 
can take from my own experience and, and particularly my experience here in the city to, to bring some examples and ideas. Um, the focus of it is to pay attention to how the form affects our neighborhood because that's really why, why we're here, right? Because there's, <laughs> there's plenty of families living in single family homes that maybe have uh, extended family living with them particularly when we have, you know, a fire season and things like that. Uh, so there could very well be just as many people living in a single family home as there would be if, if there would be potentially an ADU and a junior ADU, but that those folks living inside the home just have better sort of physical boundaries. Um, right. I want to make a comment back to, I don't know who said, we're just turning uh, R1 into R2 by adding an ADU. And in my opinion, you're not, you aren't going to turn R1 into R2 or 3 when adding an ADU or a JADU if there are certain rules that are in place, which I think I've read in, in one of your reports, Andy. Uh, if you do not permit small lot subdivision, that is the new ADU cannot be sold off separate from the main property. If there are no new meters for utilities, sewer, water, electric, gas, and no new cable, that it all has to go through the primary residence, then to me, you have not turned R1 into R2 and 3. You've simply added a guest house, which can be rented out, or as you say, occupied by multiple family members. Thank you, Commissioner Freeman. Well said. Mr. Chair, I have a few questions. Um, so, Andy, I'm, I'm looking at your number two here, and uh, it's you know specifically about R3. So uh, let's talk about R1 for a minute. Um, does this this uh, thing you do there uh, that you know this number two does that exclude people from putting carriage houses in the R1 zone? Is that the idea? Uh, I definitely, I heard from council the idea of sort of slow stepping towards bigger ideas. And, and so the suggestion is yes, that we would begin with the R3 zone and maybe it just stays with the R3 zone or maybe over time there's an appetite to expand it into the R1 zone. But of course that would come to you first and then right. it would also be reviewed by council. But, but it seems like one of the, um, you talk about sort of painting, painting yourself into corners with some of these rules, um, unintended consequence kind of situations. But um, we certainly don't want to create a situation where applicants can have a ministerial approval of a second story situation where it would have such uh, you know, neighborhood impacts oh, yeah. for views and privacy. That's where the objective design standards could could work potentially. I see, because there there could be situations where the planning department wouldn't really be allowed to um, do anything but use these uh, these standards. Uh, they wouldn't be allowed to put it before the ARC like they normally do, and have neighbors comment on it. How how would it would it you know would there be a situation where second story additions could happen? and it wouldn't be flagged and staked? These wouldn't be flagged and staked. Huh, is there any way to, that's a problem, I think. Is there any way to focus on that and, and try to make the, um, you know, I guess it's ministerial versus, uh, you know, not ministerial. Although I, we, we can certainly find out from our legal team it's possible, I would think, that um, that seems like an objective requirement for something to be flagged and staked. So yeah. potentially that could be, you know, in, in, but whether or not it could also be appealed, I don't know. It looks like Kim is ready to weigh in on this too. Yeah, so I think we might be able to require that it be staked, but a response to that staking, what would that look like in an objective design standard? Could we craft something um, we could look into that, but I, it, once again, you know, if we put up the story pole stakes, there's sort of an assumption that if somebody has a, a concern about it, they have some remedy. 
and we would have to have an objective design standard list. So that's where you might be creative with your standards um, and see where, we, you know, we're happy to look into that. Right. Well, I can just see the, um, what would happen is if somebody is losing 100% of their Bay View, let's say, because of one of these ministerial projects, that would be a, a disaster. You know, we would have very unhappy citizens um, as a result of that. And if there's any way to fashion this to avoid that situation, uh, you know, that would be, you know, really preferable. Can you say Forest Ebbs? Oh, yeah, that's right. That was, so one other comment I had was the, just in general, the, um, I don't know, probably Dan Fletcher knows about this too, but in the, in the county, they have these uh, CZ zones down near the water where they have 18 foot height limits. And 18 feet is just enough to get a garret kind of a apartment with sloping ceilings, you know, over a garage. It's a perfect, to me, 18 feet is a perfect like carriage house maximum height because you can really squeeze in interesting little units in that height. 25 feet, man, you know, close to a property line or, or a side setback is, is, you know, you're just asking for um, sort of bulk and proportion problems with those, you know, tall skinny structures like that. So I just wanted to throw out that 18 feet height for two stories is, is pretty workable, you know, within limits, you know, depends on the grade, but, but uh, you know, I just wanted to throw that out there. Has there been any discussion about that? This is the time to have that discussion. I think, okay. that, I think it's a valuable point because we do know that 16 feet does not work. No, it doesn't. Mm -hmm. I guess you could try to have seven foot ceilings as allowed, you know, you're, but you're pretty much going for munchkin housing at that point. <laughs> um. <laughs> Follow the yellow brick road. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I, so I, I mean, I, I don't, I mean, Terry, I defer to you on anything like that. And you guys, your architects, I have no idea. So 25 feet was just thrown out. I mean, I, at some height, I think the question is, do you want to balance or trade parking for height? And that's, is parking going to be more of an issue than view issue? Um, right. What will be the, what is the, what's the, what is the, the, uh, the least, desirable or that sorry the the best least desirable result um <laughs> what are you going to trade off here i mean that that and that's really what you're going to do it, it, because right now i mean i can go up to 16 feet and uh, well in my neighborhood i can't because i'm more than 500 feet from a from a bus stop um but almost everybody else in, in the city can you know go 16 feet and they can take their garage and they don't have to replace any parking so, you know, is, is that what we're willing, you know, do we, do we want to trade? Well, basically you're horse trading and that's, and that's the question. Right. Well, and I, I, and I, I, again, on my neighborhood, at least right now, you would, you couldn't do that um, because we'd have to replace the parking. Um, but, you know, I, I think at some point in time, that's a, it's a worthy discussion to have. And I feel if you can keep it at 18 feet, um and it can be done in a way that there are objective design standards that do protect views um i think that that's that's a worthwhile thing to look at yeah i, I only brought up that in in terms of uh, carriage houses really the uh, i i believe that the, our goal to answer one of andy's previous questions should be to try to maintain as much covered parking as we can and still comply with state law because we don't want to just throw that one away. That's we're asking for trouble if we're doing that. May I, I personally, I personally like Andy. I mean, uh, Terry's suggestion. Uh, some of the small space studies I've been reviewing lately talk about that when you start talking about smaller spaces, the human body really needs up to 10, 11 foot ceilings. But I, I just don't think it is practical even at 25 feet to to try to do that. So the idea of bringing down that top view uh, of the building to, as, as Terry suggests, 18 feet, I think is some merit. May I present another idea that is adjacent to this concept? 
it's the difference it's the difference between having a single story with with that much square footage uh, because we do know that if if you need up to 800 square feet in order to build a detached ADU and this site is a good example of this if they were to also want to garage the the issue is is that in the end you have very little property that wouldn't have lot coverage whereas if you were to build a carriage house instead on this site sort of you know similar in some ways to some of the neighboring sites here that have you know, three car garages things like that so if if there were to be a, a carriage house here then that would change the footprint that would um, change the amount of coverage on the lot does that make sense dan, dan we haven't heard from you yet you're uh, one of the space you know, space experts it's all very good conversation here i mean the way i look at this is how do you minimize the impact on these single family neighborhoods with the increased density. And, you know, the things that are important to me is not pushing parking out onto the street. Um, yeah. You know, when you, on the subject of height, I think, you know, if it's detached, it shouldn't be more than 16 feet. If it's attached, that it should be allowed to be compatible with the existing architecture. I'm not sure how I feel about carriage houses yet. I mean, 18 feet seems reasonable, but does it provide for uh, a, a respectful um, relationship to the architecture of the existing house. And so as I think about these things, I mean, we're not going to be able to come up with standards that are going to meet every situation. There's going to be situations that slip through the cracks that are like, oh, God, that doesn't work too well. Um, and I think our expectation should be set at creating um, choices that uh, take care of the largest amount of um, potential situations that we have. Back to the height, like if you're, and maybe this is a question for you, Andy, if you're putting a um, one of the ADUs on a second floor of an existing house, and is that technically higher than 16 feet? Is there provisions for some of that? Well, that's that brings up a wonderful point that the, um, the trouble, one of the, challenges with the state law is that we're not really given given any guidance about additions so what is allowed as a two-step legal process in other words you can certainly add on to your house and we have someone who may be doing this in the near future they add on to their house with with their own intent eventually to have this become a conversion because conversions are clearly allowed so um i i think it would be in the best interest of of our of our city to um to have a have a voice on this, it would certainly help our building department, and it would help um, it would help us to be able to request transparency with an applicant. So, if that if their intention is to construct an ADU that, um, that is on the second floor or that is an attachment that is a first and second floor, then let's have an honest conversation about that, um, and. Let's let the building department understand what the intentions are with the initial application so that they don't apply for one thing and then change it and have it become something else afterwards. This is a loophole in the current law. So basically, a, an addition to a house for an ADU um, is not necessarily allowed. But what we see happening in, in a few applications is people apply for a single family house addition and there's nothing to stop them for two months, three months from then um, converting it to an accessory dwelling unit. And Barbara Couts with Goldfarm and Lippman, when we were discussing this issue in front of our city council, said, yes, this is a built-in loophole in the state law. So the question is to the planning commission, just as Andy articulated, should we take that on from the beginning? Because I mean, we, I'm aware of at least one application where that's probably going to happen. And so if we know that's going to happen, do we want to address it up front? It's, it's a good question. And I do want to remind, and I know the commission's aware, but uh, Chair Brassfield, at some point we do need to take public comment. I understand that, but I don't know how far we're through this topic. Yeah, I can, we can take it multiple times, but I, I just want to raise a couple of small issues. And 
when we start talking about this now, what you just pointed out, uh, do we have any kind of verbiage for setting standards in that regard? Perfect segue, Chair Brassfield. So this comes back to these ideas that I shared in the beginning. So the idea number one is that additions, um, that if somebody wants to make an addition that will become an ADU or a junior ADU, it, it may be ministerial, but we would want it to have it at least meet the underlying zoning. I would agree with that. Okay, and then the second one would be, of course, is gonna be the height issue. Only in the R3 zone. Okay, but those are two that I think, it, as far as the discussion goes, I think most of us are kind of tend to, trending towards. Um, let's go ahead and uh, since we reach this kind of a stage, let's go ahead and open it up. Any more of the comments before I, I move it open for public comment for Andy on this issue? I just, I had a comment. Um, it was it was one of the letters that we received uh, just before this meeting. Um, a guy was referring to uh, um, South Salinas or East Salinas in uh, he was hoping that uh, that Monterey wouldn't go in that direction, where there's where there's great numbers of people living in great numbers of houses, and uh, he he was uh, he was he was kind of afraid to uh, to to, uh, to see that that we might be going in that direction. Well, having been raised here in the peninsula, and I can tell you that in conversations I had with my paternal grandmother, she said that back in the late 20s and 30s, everybody filled every single room that they could have in their house with renters. So I wouldn't say that it's a new trend. I just say it's going to be a different one. Uh, Mike, uh, there's a case that comes to the California Supreme Court, the city of Santa Barbara versus Adamson where the city tried to uh, get a bunch of a commune, prevent a commune from uh, operating in an R1 zone. And in effect, the California Supreme Court said in a four to three vote, a commune is like a family and uh, a family is entitled without regard to numbers to be in one house. There you go. So yeah. that was Salinas applies to Salinas, and that would also apply uh, to uh, to Monterey. But of course, if you're renting it out, that would be a different uh, story. But how do you prove that? Well, okay, thanks. Especially since in those situations, it's been my experience as a city prosecutor enforcing or attempting to enforce that code section in Simi Valley. Uh, <laughs> The person who's in charge of the rental takes in cash and uh, there are no records. And when it comes time to uh, subpoena that individual, they're gone. Thank you. Um, any other comments before we go to public comment? Okay, Sarah, if you would, let's uh, open it up for public comment. Sure. Just another friendly reminder uh, that you can join by Zoom uh, by either going directly into the meeting, uh, which the link is posted at isearchmonterey.org, or you can join by telephone by dialing 833-568-8864, and our meeting ID is 161-563-6904. I know we do have a few people on the call. So if you would be interested in making a public comment, please raise your hand by dialing star nine and then I can unmute you. Let's see, do we have any public comment at this time? You can also either use star nine or if you're in the Zoom, you could use the raise hand function. Oh, it looks like I did have someone raise their hand. So give me just a moment and let me go ahead and allow you to speak. There we go. And go ahead and just unmute please to share your thoughts. Great, thanks. Can you hear me? 
Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Emily Hamm. I'm with Monterey Bay Economic Partnership. Um, and uh, we've been working relatively closely with United Way Monterey County on their uh, on supporting their ADU initiative, um, which uh, really pushes for um, as low barrier ADU development um, as possible. Um, so we would just like to add our, our support into that initiative. Um, and I also had a question, and I don't know if it's possible uh, for maybe Andy to answer, but I'm wondering if there are occupancy uh, limits or requirements um, for ADUs. Uh, I believe uh, someone uh, was was concerned about potential overcrowding, um, so I didn't know if those if the same requirements um, of multifamily housing were in place there. Uh, thank you. Andy, you got an answer for that? Well, I, I think just as Commissioner Millich just um, shared with us that there's certainly case law that says that we, we cannot uh, determine the number of, for a family, the number of residents that um, make up a family. Okay. Yeah, and I'm in, if you're paying attention to tiny houses, they're packing remarkable numbers of people in them. So thank you. Uh, I think if any other phone calls coming in. Let me take a look. Um, it doesn't look like anyone is raising their hand at this time. Just a friendly reminder to either raise your hand if you'd like to share public comment with the Planning Commission. Um, you could raise your hand by hitting the raise hand function in Zoom, or if you're on the telephone with us, dial star nine. Thank you. And it looks like there's no one else um, speak or raising their hand at this time, but I'll go ahead and keep an eye on that. Thank you. Um, Let's bring it back. And yes. uh, if we could uh, maybe give Andy some direction, for, no matter where we go on this, on the height issue in the R3. Hey, Mike, so, could we, uh, could make, we maybe do a, a straw poll? Well, That's so what I, Andy, what, is there anything you need from us remaining? I mean, are, do you have any questions for us? I mean, it seems like the only two issues we've talked about in reality are those the, the the two on your slide is there anything else that you need direction from us to to um to resolve before you can actually craft language to bring back to us uh well we have those seven questions that were part of the staff report i would say the um the airport safety zone is is um uh, is a good start um and and perhaps for some of the questions within that group of seven, uh, I can imagine for some of those, it might be easiest if I were to just put together an ordinance and then and then we go from there. I agree with that, Andy. I, I yeah. Think you take the first stab at it and give us something that's more organized to discuss. That I, I agree. I guess the idea is we are gonna be um, reviewing these seven questions today. It's up to you. We certainly can. Okay. We, do we, it so far. we could do a of those seven questions. And in many ways, I felt that those two uh, ideas were sort of a culmination of some of the questions, but um, I, I would be I happy to walk should, away with a straw poll. We, we, we reviewed the seven questions initially, and I think that you should continue on with your work to bring it back to us to discuss. I'm happy to do that. Well, I, I do have a couple of sort of other questions that, you know, it's, it seems like a pity that we're going to be adding probably hundreds of new uh, housing units to the city of Monterey in the next couple of years. And there's no way we can take advantage of that for uh, low income purposes that we're always, we're always at such a, uh, there's always so much pressure on the city to provide low income housing and it doesn't seem like this really gives us any opportunity to address that it's just the nature of the beast don't forget the water issue terry yeah right i mean you know as far as hundreds of units where's the water going to come from well and i do want to suggest though that uh, i don't know if anybody's been following where the water district is right now with um with uh they, they have preliminarily approved the idea of, of uh, giving 
the city of Monterey, 20 acre feet. And uh, it's, it's combined with their efforts to work with the State Water Resources Control Board. And I bring that up right now because if we want to have ADUs be deed restricted as affordable, the only way to make that happen is to have a resource that we exchange for that contract. And we could do that with water. So if we do in the near future have water available, then if, if council were to decide that ADUs were a, um, a place that that's, Priority. Keep in mind that uh, I just want to make it clear that because we talked about hundreds of units, I I really doubt that we'll have hundreds of ADUs. I think we'd be lucky if we have thirty to forty. Okay. Uh, well, let me clarify. Let me clarify. Um, New ones. We have existing ones that are probably not. We have twelve. Yeah, but you're right. If if it were, were to happen, it would have there would have to be an incentive for somebody to put that on their property. Well, it's also very expensive. The cost is 150,000 for a 750 square foot ADU. Um, right. So it's, it's cost prohibitive, um, but the size that you end up with, I mean, you can only charge so much for 750 square feet on the peninsula. Any other questions of Andy? We wanna table this and bring it back. Uh, you want to take a straw poll like uh, Mike suggested? What is the got flavor? enough out of today? Um, I think the direction was, I mean, I don't think you have to take a vote. You can, but, um, you know, to that Andy would take the seven concepts and potentially prepare draft ordinance language, and we would be bringing that back to you. And don't forget uh, an opinion from the city attorney on the ADA. Yeah. Right. I haven't really discussed the uh, the deed restriction, but I, you know, it was mentioned, but I, I think that also needs to be included in that. Because I, I can see that turning into a real rat's nest. I'll also bring back more information about the bus stops. Thank you. And uh, could you just mention briefly um, the other cities on the peninsula? How have they reacted? So. I read that Seaside didn't adopt anything and just uh, let the state uh, regulations uh, be in place and they're going to see how it shakes out. That's correct. Yes, I I, I know that uh, being at the counter and answering questions, it would sure be nice to understand what, this, what the guidance is from our decision makers might be uh be, in part because it is so difficult to interpret the state law so <laughs> it's like watching sausage being made <laughs> yeah <laughs> anything else thank you andy once again you're keeping us on track appreciate it okay Going to the last item on the agenda, item five, it's a planning update. Kim? Just a couple quick comments. Um, the city council will be considering the um, cannabis ordinance for the industrial zone and testing on December 1st. Um, so you may wanna watch that public hearing. It should be interesting. Um, also in early December, we're gonna be bringing to you um, some work that we've been doing on trans uh, we the city received a grant from caltrans to look at the future of coastal flooding and del monte avenue mm -hmm. and so um, that report is being finalized with two or three alternatives and we'll be bringing that to you probably the first meeting in december and then we'll need to move that on to council in january or probably early february for um, final consideration because the grant deadline is the end of February. So we've been holding public workshops. Um, there has been quite a bit of public input to date on um, what, what happens with um, when Lake Elestero and the ocean potentially reconnect. So look forward to that in December, probably the first meeting in December, and then we'll be trying to finish out the year. 
So if you have any Thank questions you. for me, I'm happy to answer. Any questions of Kim? Hearing none, I'd like to uh, close the meeting before our normal ad adjournment and uh, close at uh, 25 after. Appreciate it. And thank you all for coming. Appreciate the public input. Thanks, Mark.